2 Timothy chapter number 4. Before we start reading, bear with me, we're going somewhere. Y'all know what an idiom is? The phrase that people use commonly. And because of that phrase, you know what they're saying. Sometimes they don't always make sense to me. One of those is the phrase, head over heels. My head is always over my heels. That's why I did. I knew what the phrase meant, but it didn't make sense to me. I'm like, right now, head above heels, we're good. I'm like, why is that different than usual? Fun story. When I don't know something, I have to know the answer. So, I looked into it a while ago. Phrase is about as old as the United States of America. Before that, the only way you would ever see it is if it was in relation to somebody taking a fall, and usually it resulted in great injury, but it was called heels overhead. That makes sense to me. If your heels are above your head, you're in trouble, right? But you would mostly find it in newspaper articles. You'd find it in tales of people that fell a great distance off of a cliff, or they were on the ladder, and then they went heels overhead. You knew... Heels overhead, that's bad. Right? It meant that they didn't just slip. They went head first. And then somewhere around 1780s, somebody wrote head over heels and meant it the way that it's still used today. That it means that somebody's greatly in love with something. But it still didn't make sense to me. Heels overhead, I get. Head over heels, I don't. Because again, my head's always over my heels, right? Well, any of y'all ever seen the movies where they get somebody really flexible? Or in the old cartoons where somebody would get really walloped and then it showed them all tied up like a pretzel? Right? That's what head over heels really means. It means that somebody's heels are behind their head. Their head is on top of their heels, literally. That means that they all tied up. In other words, they can't go nowhere. Doesn't mean that they have fallen, so to speak. It means that literally whatever they saw has got them all tied up in knots. Okay? So keep that in mind. Verse number 10, 2 Timothy chapter number 4. For Demas hath forsaken me, Having loved this present world and has departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Tychus have I sent to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, but especially the parchments. Now we know that Paul wrote Second Timothy to Timothy, right? Ordained the first bishop of the church of Ephesus. So, in his letter, second letter, right, chapter number three, we find that in the last days perilous time shall come. The Apostle Paul is trying to equip Timothy for Timothy's ministry after the Apostle Paul is gone. Because if you know, verse number uh, 13, he says, especially the parchments, right, those are the epistles that he's already written, meaning that this isn't the first one that he wrote. He's getting towards the tail end of his ministry. He knows, hey, I'm getting ready to go off the scene. Right? And Paul knew the entire time he'd have to go stand before Caesar. Right? He knew that nothing was going to, but he, he knew that God wouldn't kill him before that. He knew he might have to go through a whole lot, but he knew where the goal was. How else could he be able to say that I fought a good fight and I finished my course? Unless he knew where the finish line was. Right? But, here we find reference to several people. Verse number 11 is a great story of grace and forgiveness. Right? Mark, that's the same Mark that, called, that caused Barnabas to fall away from the Apostle Paul. After that, that's where we have Paul and Silas. Somebody who at one point was a hindrance to the Apostle Paul, he says, bring Mark with you. That's John Mark, not the Apostle Mark. He says, bring John Mark with you. For now, he's profitable. God's done a work in him 
and I hold no grudges. Right? You look at verse number 14, you find people that did him evil. Alexander the coppersmith. It says, greatly withstood his words. You go on to read in verse number 16, where the Apostle Paul says, at my beginning, right, right as God saved him. He was still called Saul of Tarsus. He said, nobody stood by me. But then he also says, I can't hold it against them. He said, if I was in their shoes, I wouldn't have believed me either. Then we find that great verse number 17, notwithstanding the Lord stood by me. He said, I can't blame the brethren for not trusting somebody that persecuted them. And, you know, for all they knew, this is just another way to get into the mid wolves in sheep's clothing. He says, I couldn't blame them. He says, I don't hold it against them. No ill feelings. He says, because the Lord stood by me and established me. He said, he proved that what I said was true. I mean, we find reference to Titus. Look at the next book over. Same guy. Right? We find that the Apostle Paul sent him unto Dalmatia. Right? Cretans to Galatia. We find that the ministry, the work that the Apostle Paul started, keeps on going. Those that were born into the faith, I mean, you can look at Titus, chapter 1, verse number 4, he says to Titus, by own son in the faith. Titus got saved because of the Apostle Paul's ministry. God called Titus to the ministry. The Apostle Paul took him under his wing as a you know, child in the faith. He raised him spiritually in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and equipped him. Because, not going to lie, it makes it a whole lot easier teaching Sunday school with this. Titus didn't have this. Everything he taught, he had to learn firsthand from the Apostle Paul until he received this epistle. But even then, we don't know how long it was before the parchments got copied and copied and copied and distributed from where they were originally sent. I don't know how long it took the book of Revelation to be copied from them seven churches in Asia and then spread throughout the rest of the world. I know God did it because I got a copy of it. But I mean, Titus had to be equipped when he went. The only thing that Titus could pray was, Lord, stir up my memory. Stir up that pure mind within me. Remind me of the things that your apostle showed me so that I can preach and teach to your people. Not an enviable position. But yet we find those that are faithful to do it. And then we find somebody who's mentioned three times in your Bible. His name is Demas. Right? Demas, in verse number 10, it says, hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica. The other two times that we find reference to Demas, he's more comparable to Titus, to Timothy, to those that are in the fight for the Lord. In Philemon 1, verse number 24, you'll find that Demas' heart was in the Father's business. He was there hand in hand, fellow laborer or fellow servant, whichever one you want to use, with the Apostle Paul. He's not just along for the ride. He's got his hands in the dirt. Right? He's tilling, he's, he's working for the Lord's cause. He was about the Father. But then in Colossians 4, verse number 14, you'll find that Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. He's not working no more. He's all caught up in formality. Well, if you're writing them a letter, tell them I said, hey. His heart wasn't in it. Doesn't say that Demas delivered the letter. We know that Onesimus right, delivered the letter to Philemon. Right? He used to be a servant. He got saved. Right? Still a servant, but the Apostle Paul said, forgive him for my sake. Forgive him for the Lord's sake. Forgive him for your own sake. But in Colossians, we just find that Demas, he's just there. Tell everybody, I said, hey. A lot of Christians blow in and out. Hey, glad you got to see me. Well, glad you were here, but I came to see Jesus. Demas cared more about people knowing that he was with the Apostle Paul 
that actually do anything. And then here, we find that Demas was in a far country. Started with the father's business, then he got into formalities, and then now he's way out in the middle of nowhere. In fact, Thessalonica was one of the capitals of the Roman Empire at that point. They divided it up into states and everything else. Thessalonica was a capital. It was a very carnal place. Very worldly place. Full of idolatries. Full of false gods. That's why it's a miracle that the church of Thessalonica got started. That they turned from them graven images and it said embrace God. But I believe, unless I'm confusing it with a different epistle, the Apostle Paul said that the love of the church of Thessalonica was a beacon to all the other churches. He said, the fact that you got in, but you got all the way in. You're just in love with God. He says, it's made the church very, you know, very well known. Right? I dare say that the love of the Emmanuel Baptist Church is something that's pretty well known. You just love God, love God's people. People are going to find out about it. But see, Demas, he hath forsaken me. Well, what's that word forsaken mean? It means to abandon. If you abandon something, you are entrusted with something and you neglect your duty. To abandon is not to falter. We all make mistakes. By the grace of God, we, you know, without the grace of God, we make a whole lot more. And by the grace of God, we'll make less. It's not to falter. Abandoned means you know that it's your responsibility and you full well know that when you turn your back, you're letting something die. If you abandon a child, the child cannot provide for itself. If you abandon the burden that God gave to you, there's no guarantee that the burden will be picked up. It says forsaken. Forsaken also to reject. If you reject something, really think about it. If you were to reject it, you have to convince yourself that it's not true or that you don't need it. If you reject something in your heart, not in your head, not with your words, but in your heart, you have to divorce yourself from something. That means something's got to die. Either part of me, or I've got to kill the idea of whatever I'm getting ready to reject. Those that came to Christ expecting something, usually found that when they walked away, they rejected Him. Because they didn't get what they wanted. But He offered them what they needed. They reject because, well, that's not what I wanted. the same time somebody rejects the word of God they either think that it's not true or that they don't need it so in their mind the word of God is none effect unto them right I think of those that are God stamped reprobate on them like we heard about on Wednesday night you can preach until you're blue in the face the word of God's not going to be because God's tested them out worthless but they will reject anything that has to do with God. They will, for lack of a better term, they'll crucify anything that has to do with the Lord Jesus so that they don't have to deal with it. To forsake means to reject. But then to forsake means to betray. If you forsook something, that means at one point you was in it. You were a part of it and it was a part of you. You accepted it in order to forsake. If I never received something, I can't forsake it. If I wasn't a part of something, I can't walk out on something. But see, to betray, if I was a part of it, and nothing, the status quo hadn't changed, it's still the same. But what are we talking about? Talking about Jesus. Talking about the gospel. Talking about the word of God. Always the same. So if I have betrayed it, what changed? I did. And to betray means to 
Where I was once, now I've become an enemy of what I used to be. I fight against those things, whether directly or indirectly. I may not be out on the street corner preaching, don't go to church. But my lifestyle may say the same thing, but more effectively, to other people. But look at the way he's living now. He didn't really believe everything he used to say. I knew that everything that, you know, he knew it wouldn't last. That's where we find him. He's forsaken the Apostle Paul. Well, who's the Apostle Paul? The Apostle to the Gentiles. When the Apostle Paul says he forsook me, he means he forsook me, he forsook my ministry, and he forsook my Lord. He walked out on us. Where'd he go? Thessalonica. Hotbed of carnality. And why? Having loved this present world. In other words, what the Apostle Paul saying. Where Demas once was head over heels for Jesus, now he's head over heels for the world. Now remember, head over heels, you didn't get hurt. Head over, heels over head, you got hurt. But head over heels, you didn't get hurt. Right? Something caught your eye and you stopped so quick that you tumbled and now you're stuck there. That's what head over heels means. Well, Demas loved the present world. He went head over heels for the world. What's that mean? At one point, Demas saw something. He allowed it, you know, lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, could be anything. Don't know what it was, just know that he loved the world more than he loved God. And he saw something that caused him to stumble, to falter, like we talked about. Right? Not going to pretend to be holy today. We all stumble. We all falter. We've already said that. Right? The worst thing you can do if you stumble is to stay there. But see, he's head over heels. He can't help himself up. He needs somebody to help him. If you're head over heels, remember, your head's touching your heels. You're not walking very far if your head is touching your heels. Right? I'm not. If I was in that position... I got the tightest hamstrings in northern Kentucky. I wouldn't be able to get up because something would be torn if I was in that position. Right? Anybody ever mess up so bad it took the Lord to come along to get you up out of it? Right? He just stumbled. But there's a difference between stumbling and then staying there. Stumbling means... I made the mistake, but I realize I ought not have made the mistake. In my heart, I feel guilty for letting the Lord down. Ask Him to forgive me of it. And then we get back on the way called straight. I mean, certainly, the problem it's a problem to stumble. But it's not a problem too big for God. When we convince ourselves that the stumble has already caused us to fall out of the race... Right? You've never watched too many sports movies. A lot of people get hurt but still finish. Right? Read stories through war of great acts of heroism. People that had every reason to throw in the towel just kept on going. Why? Because the thing that they loved wouldn't let them quit. See, Demas didn't fall out because he made a mistake. He stumbled because he saw something that he desired more. See, that's the thing about being head over heels. If you head over heels, you're stuck, but you convince yourself you like being stuck. That's why when somebody says he's head over heels for it, he ain't going nowhere. Right? He is head over heels in love with her. What's that mean? She's got him hook, line, and sinker, and he likes it. Right? The fish don't fight because they like being hooked. They fight because they want to get away from the hook. Right? But if you head over heels, you're hooked, you know you're hooked, and you're saying, reel me in. 
That's head over heels. You like where you're at. And let's be honest, most of the time if a guy's head over heels for a girl, it's because she's out of his league, he knows it, and he's going to do everything he can to keep her. Right? Yeah. And let's be honest, Brother J.D., you'd spend everything you got, you'd give up everything you ever will get. Exactly. When you head over heels, you stop thinking about what you had, and all you can think about is what's got you hooked. You don't care about you no more. But when you head over heels for the world, that's a bad place to be. When you stop caring about what the world does to you, and all you care about is what you can give up in order to get more of the world, that's a dangerous place to be in. I've said it before. The Bible says that we're not ignorant of the devil's devices. The Bible also calls them snares. You know what that means? A trap works because it traps you. If you could get out of a trap, it wouldn't be a trap. If the bear could find a way out of the bear trap, it wouldn't be called a bear trap. It'd be called a bear looser. I would slow them down for a second, but we didn't get them. It's not a trap. A snare only works if it snares you. So if you went head over heels for the world, you're stuck. You got yourself into it, but you can't get yourself out of it. Well, why do you say that, Brother Jordan? Because this thing called sin was bigger than us to start with. I didn't do anything to have my sins forgiven other than the fact that I realized Jesus already did it all and all I had to do was ask Him to save me. So why would I think afterwards that I can handle a little bit of sin? A little bit of sin caused sin to pass upon all men. Death by sin. Just looking at something, I mean, we can look at a lot, but Demas, just beholding something is enough for it to hook you and then as you reel, get reeled in you just fall head over heels for it stop fighting it well what does forsake mean we've already talked about it to betray to abandon keep in mind if you're head over heels all you can think about is what you want and how to get more of it you're not thinking about the things you're leaving behind, the things that you sacrifice. You're not thinking about yourself. When you fall head over heels for the world, you're betraying yourself. The spirit and the flesh are always at enmity. The very Holy Ghost we just sang about in the congregational, the comfort, we grieve Him every second of every day that we're head over heels for the world. He bears witness with our spirit that we know we shouldn't be there. And the flesh and the carnal part of our mind that wants to stay where we're at, we're betraying our self. I mean, the Bible does say that God turned some over to the destruction of the flesh so that the soul might be saved. We can cause so much grief and turmoil in our own heart that God will say, enough's enough. Bring them on home. Not for their sake, but for the sake of the cause of Christ. They're doing too much harm. Get them off the front line. We don't know what befell Demas, but I do know wherever he wound up, he got more than he bargained for. Because when you head over heels, you can't defend yourself. Your ankles are behind your head. Nope. I mean, Matea might be able to. She's a gymnast. But I doubt very many people in the building be able to do that and then get up and then walk away from it. Let alone get yourself out of it. Even if you manage to get your legs back where they're supposed to be, something's going to be pulled, something's going to be torn, you hurting. You're not going to be able to get up and run back to the Father's house. That's the dangers of going head over heels for the world. 
you're there. You know you if you do come to yourself like the prodigal son. You're there. You know you shouldn't be there, but you can't get yourself out. You've forsake you've betrayed everything that you once were. So then, while we're here, let's just go ahead and hit this. If Demas ever did come to the point, I don't know. Apostle Paul doesn't mention him after this. But if Demas ever got to the point that he did repent, if you go head over heels for the world, even after God brings you out of the world, you're going to have to deal with a whole lot of demons. Skeletons in the closet. Demons wasn't going to walk around, you know, didn't want to be in the same room as the Apostle Paul if he ever got right with God. Because every time he looked at him in the back of his mind, something said, you betrayed him. You forsook that man. Was it under the blood? Yeah, but my memories aren't. That's why i got to wrestle with them. If you go ahead over here, there's going to be some scars. Even if you do get back into the race, you may not be running as quick as you used to. You may have temptations that you didn't have before that are trying to pull you out even harder now. You may have things that only you and God know that you have to deal with each and every day just to stay in the fight that before you didn't have to deal with it. And see, that's the thing. If a guy ever goes head over heels for a girl, but she don't go head over heels for him, he'll always remember it. May not think about it every day, but every now and then he'll just, you's dumb. Why'd you do that? Right? Well, same thing's true spiritually. Worst thing, I mean, the Apostle Paul said that he doesn't think about them things that are behind. God forbid, why? Because if he thought about that, he wouldn't be able to be busy about the Father's business. If he was thinking about all the reasons that he wasn't worthy, then he never would have got anything done. Why? Because he would have been filled with such shame and guilt and despair. Forgetting those things which are behind, I press toward the high calling of Christ Jesus. In other words, he's saying, we all got things we wish we could forget. Just because you went head over heels doesn't mean God still can't use you. Doesn't mean that you still can't be an effective witness. Doesn't mean that you can't be used greatly by God. But what it does mean is that you're going to have to put more effort and to getting past things that you knew you shouldn't have been involved in in the first place. You're going to have to look people in the eye that you let down and apologize. It's a hard thing to do. But see, when you forsake, when you walk out, when you reject, when you abandon, you don't go alone. You hurt other people. I don't believe that the Apostle Paul, when he wrote this, wrote it in a derogatory sense. Don't believe he wrote it in a condemning sense. I believe he's heartbroken. He's writing to Timothy, and he says, Timothy, verse number 11, only Luke is with me. He's saying, God sent everybody else away, and he said, Demas was the last one left, and he forsook me. He says that he sent Cretans to Galatia and Titus unto Dalmatia. He's saying, I sent them away to go further the gospel. He said, Luke and Demas were supposed to be here. He says, Demas forsook me. Part of the Apostle Paul went with Demas. Because the Apostle Paul, I believe, had a burden for him to get right. Had a burden to help him. A burden just to sit down, talk to him, reason with him. But the thing is, if you're head over heels, you're not hearing any of it. You're deaf to what you walked out on. You already made up your mind long before you take the first step out. It's already settled down here. 
And if it's settled down here, you'll ignore, you'll twist the words, you'll come up with excuses while whoever's telling you what they're telling you isn't true. Why? Because you've got them rose-colored glasses on, everything looks good. Because you're head over heels. You're stuck with whatever you're stuck with, and you're okay with it, because that's all you want. It says he loved this present world. There's a world that you can fall in love with. It's called heaven. There's one of these days going to be new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. Uh, we just get a glimpse. And John was just, you know, limited to the crayons that we already have in the box to try and color it in for us. Right? He saw it all as it will be, but he's limited. How do I explain to you what I just saw? I said, well, it kind of looks like Jasper, but really Jasper doesn't do it credit. Look like gold, but it's pure gold. You can see right through it. How do you know it was gold if you could see right through it anyway? Just questions that I think about. I'll never know the answer to it until we get to glory, but then it won't matter. Right, and then he says, well, then there's this gate made out of pearl. Not pearls, pearl. And he's telling you how big this is. That's a big clam that made that pearl. And then there's 12 of them. Right, he starts going into detail. But Demas didn't fall in love with that world. He fell in love with the present world. See, here's the thing. Demas was in. I believe he's saved. Believed that he labored in the Lord. His heart was in the right spot. So he knew how wicked, how damaging, how detrimental the world could be to his life, but he loved it anyway. But there's one person, you know, they say love is blind. A Christian can't really say that. Because if you love Christ, He outlined everything and every reason that you have to love Him. But if you're a Christian and you fall in love with the world, you know what the world is because you came out of it. You can't walk in and say, well, I didn't know. We're without excuse. We've tasted and seen that the Lord was good, so why would we go back to that which was bad? And here's the thing. Because God's merciful, God's long-suffering, and God gives a whole lot more grace than we deserve, which is none, and we don't deserve any, God may throw up some of them red flags along the way, put some roadblocks in your life, but there's no guarantee that He will. For him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. God may let you just walk on out and have your plate and eat it too. Because you already know. Just the very fact that you're saved, you know that what you used to be isn't what you should desire to be. You may still desire to be, but somewhere back in here and down in here, you know, I'll not be doing this. That's why it takes somebody so long to make up their mind to fall out of church because they're wrestling with the Holy Ghost the entire time. You've got to fight tooth and nail just to convince yourself that everything that you know isn't true. So by the time Demas did get down to Thessalonica, he had a chip on his shoulder. Because everybody that he's passed along the way that he knew said, Hey, Demas, how you doing? Good to see you. I love you, brother. And all the while, he's thinking, I wish you didn't see me. Get out of here. I don't want anything to do with you. So there's no telling what you'll do by the time you get to where you want to go. I mean, you got some people never leave the house of God. But yet, not right with the father. Go look at the prodigal son's older brother. He was there working the whole time, but in his heart, he wasn't right with the father. Father had to sit him down and explain to him. 
yeah I gave him a little bit of inheritance he says you've got everything I own he didn't know how good he had it maybe that was the problem that Demas had he didn't realize all that God had given him access to but either way he ended up head over heels and once he got there he wanted to be there here's the thing you fall it's real easy for somebody to help you up it's really hard asking for help it's nothing aren't we supposed to bear one another's burdens aren't we supposed to edify exhort encourage aren't we fitly framed together so that if one of us falls really we're all hurting it's nothing for one of us to go help the other one up by the hand restore such a one in spirit of meekness hey I've fallen before dust yourself off get under the blood keep on going I may not have felt the same way you did but I felt and it hurt if you need me to sit here with you for a little bit if you want to put an arm around my shoulder because you're limping a little bit we'll get you where you need to go that's not a problem in fact those that are right we've got to enjoy doing that and if you've ever helped somebody that has stumbled I have found that if you stumble you've got a whole lot more people there to help you up the more we help others the harder it is for us to fall out because everybody just wants to help us get back in we all have weak days we've all got bad days we've all got days where we did more than stumble right we went heels over head off the mountain thankfully the Lord gave his people gave us the Holy Ghost gave us the blood for faithful to confess he's faithful to forgive good news is it can all be made right the bad news is you've got to want to get it made right everybody in the world can want to help you God can stand there with open arms back in you know back to the house of God but unless you want to you won't but how do you get to where when you stumble you do want to get up you do want to get dusted off you do like that song brother Clint says take off the old robe put the new one back on and I can think about that just for a second every time I stumble I dirty the righteousness of God because he's robed me in his righteousness but every time I get up and ask him to forgive me he puts a brand new robe on me he don't give me the old one because I messed that one up he gives me a new one and no matter how many times I ask for the new one he's always got one just in my size and you know why he keeps giving it to it? Because as long as I've got that on, I remind him of his son. He's got to get rid of the old one because that reminds him of me. It wasn't anywhere in my notes, but there you go. But how do you get to where you want to get back up? It's all a heart thing. Do you know that word love right there? That's that same agape love that we find in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That is a sacrificial form of love. Demas loved the world so much he would sacrifice anything to keep it. That's why he didn't want to get back up. That's why he didn't want to get dusted off. That's why he didn't want to get back into the things of God. Because he was sacrificing everything that he had to get what he wanted. It's the same kind of love. It's just pointed in the wrong direction. But I do know this. I can get up here and tell you all the reasons why we should be head over heels for God. All the reasons that we should just be all in. Fighting a good fight. Doing our best to finish our course. But the truth is, you got to let it take root down here. what was Jesus' indictment of the Pharisees with your lips you do honor me but your heart is far from me we can say all the right things maybe to other people maybe we know just all the right things to say to ourselves to justify where we're at in our own minds 
But the truth is, if you just get on your knees and ask God, Lord, help me fall back in love with you. That seed that He put in you, what's the first fruit? Love. Say, Lord, water that seed that I did my best to cut off. That I did my best to pull up out of my life. Well, good news is He put you in you, which means you can't pull it out of you. If I did it, I can undo it. If I wanted the world and I sacrificed to get to the world, I'm going to have to keep sacrificing things to stay in the world. If somebody gave it to me, they can take it away. But see, God does it and it's permanent. Think about this. If God does it and He promised that He would do it, God can't even undo it because He can't go against His own word. He's exhorted His word above His own name. But see, because He put it in you, He can cause it to grow. And He doesn't ask you to get everything wiped off and cleaned up before it'll start. He says, just come on back. Draw nigh to God and He'll draw nigh to you. He's the one that cleaned you up in the first place. He'll clean you up. So long as in your heart you truly desire it. But here's the biggest danger. Sometimes things come down to a instant decision. If the prodigal son came to himself but stayed in the hog pen, sooner or later he'd have justified why he was in the hog pen. While you desire the things of God, you got to get going back to the Father's house. Because the world's going to do its best to throw a wet blanket on it, snuff it out, beat you back down, convince you that this is as good as it's ever going to get. Then your flesh is going to be fighting to stay there. So in that moment, on faith, you've got to act. The moment I step in the mud, you know, pull of mud, the moment I get a foot in that quicksand, that desire, oh, I shouldn't have done this. i got to get back. Lord, help me. Well, if I have that thought but I don't act on it, I still stay in the same spot. Doesn't matter if you're in a far country. Doesn't matter if you head over heels for the world or if you just made a mistake. If we don't act on that space of grace that He gives us where we realize, uh-oh, I'm wrong. It's only a space. And if I stay there longer than that time that God allotted me to say, hey, I will not be here. If I let that moment go by, there's no promise it will ever come again. Because I'm not stronger than the world. I'm not stronger than sin. I'm not stronger than my own flesh. But I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I don't overcome by what I am. I overcome by what He is. My faith is not in how well I can take the Word of God and apply it to my life. My faith is in that if I hide His Word in my heart, I won't sin against Him because He's got all the ammo He needs to keep me in line. It's not about what I can do. It's about how much I let Him do. We forget about that when we're head over heels. And we say, well, how do I get out? You don't. He's got to come and get you out. But he'll do it. All you got to do is ask him. Whether it's a stumble, whether it's a fall, whether we're just smack dab in the middle of the world and love it, all it takes is one cry to God. And he can get us out of it. Doesn't mean the process of getting back to where we were is going to be easy. I've got to re -go, you know, redo all them things. The times that He put me on the potter's wheel and the time that He put me in the fire, I may have to go through them again. But it'll be worth it. But to love the world, to kill everything that God gave you in your life, to go back to what you were, the most miserable existence there could be. Because before you didn't know any better. But now you do. And you think about how good you had it at the Father's house. And then you just get more guilty, more depressed, more dejected, 
and it's a downward spiral. That snowball effect, where once it starts, nobody can stop it. There's a short period where you can. What's that called? Grace. What's that called? The Holy Ghost just pulling on that line where you're anchored to Jesus Christ saying, hey, you're going a little bit too far. Come on back. Head over heels, dangerous place to be. If you've got your heels touching your head, can't defend yourself. Can't see which way the next blow is coming from. See, Jesus just told me to take his yoke upon me. That means he's pointing it. I just got to keep following. He's steering. Really, he's got most of the load. And every time I go to go somewhere, I can't. I'm yoked. Even though I may make a misstep, I can't go very far. Because he's going to pull me right back to where I need to be. Why do you think that he... Ask the apostle, is it hard for you to kick against the prick? It hurts when you try to go one way, but you're yoked with somebody going a different way. It's hard. In fact, it's impossible. You get close enough to him that you're yoked with him, that's all the way in. You're not following the cart. You're not walking next to him saying, well, I wonder what all this contraption is. No, you just get all the way in. You won't let yourself walk away from God. Because you're head over heels for Him. Don't be like Demas. Don't be like Diotrephes. I don't know what it is with people in the New Testament name starts with D. Not be like the Apostle John. Somebody's going to betray me. Lord, who is it? Everybody else isn't me. Is it I? Lord, I know how much I love you. I'm not going to be the one that walks out on you. So who is it? He's yoked up. He knew he couldn't walk away. Everything that he had was in the Lord. He's more than head over heels. I mean, Jesus loved the Lord so much. He's exiled and he's still worshiping God on a Sunday in the Spirit. He's on an island all by himself, and he says, Lord, at least I can hang out with you. Didn't bother him one bit. They thought he was going to die on that island. He came back. He said, oh, by the way, I got a new message to preach. I know y'all didn't like the old ones. Maybe you like this one. What are you saying? What's in your heart, where your heart is, and what you fuel inside of your heart makes a whole lot of difference and it can cause a whole lot of harm or you can do a whole lot of help for the ministry do you struggle to find good bible based resources to supplement your personal devotions if so head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on bookstore where we have a ton of resources and as always thanks for listening